Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the last NANS Journal Club of the Year and, and last seminars in a series of seminars featuring Wagos neurostimulation scientists. For attendees who are listening to us for the first time, I would like to say a few words about this Journal Club and people who are behind of this initiative. We have been successfully running this journal club for more than a year, starting in October 2020. We had a great success in inviting outstanding scientists. We always had an engaged audience and great discussions. We have been concentrating on trainees to give them opportunity to present their newly published papers. The idea of this journal club originally was introduced by Professor Julie Felicis who is a chair of the Department of Neuroscience and Experimental Therapeutics at Albany Medical College and, and, a, and newly appointed dean of the Charles Schmidt College of Medicine at the Florida Atlantic University. Dr. Ilkna Telkes and me, Irina Duff, are co-directors of this journal club. A special thank to our NAMS coordinators, Adriana Zibaneller and Kyla Gustafson, who are helping me to organize and run this journal club. Before we start, I would like to remind you a few rules of our meeting today. All of us are going to be muted, muted during the presentation. Please uh, write your question in the question box in, on the left side of your screen. We will be happy to address your questions in the end of the presentation. Today we will look how vagus nerve stimulation induces widespread cortical and behavioral activation. I'm so delighted to introduce our speakers today, Professor David McCormick and Dr. Lindsay Collins. Dr. McCormick is a professor, professor emeritus at the Yale University of School of Medicine. Currently, he is the director of the Institute for Neuroscience in the University of Oregon. For more than 35 years, he was continuously funded by NIH and other foundations. In 2015, he was elected as a member of National Academy of Medicine. Dr. Lindsay Collins is a postdoctoral fellow in the lab of, doc, of doc, Dr. McCormick. She received her bachelor in psychology in 2012 from the Wake Forest University and PhD in psychology in 2017 from the University of Virginia. In 2017, she joined the lab of Professor McCormick. Currently, she is a recruitment chair in the University of Oregon Postdoctoral Association and the member of the University of Oregon Outreach Committee on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. We're so happy to have you today, Professor McCormick and, and Dr. Collins. Without any further ado, please take away. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Where Lindsay and I are very excited to be here to give a presentation about Lindsay's work in my laboratory. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna give a brief introduction to the topic that uh, my laboratory investigates, and then Lindsay will tell you all about her work. Okay. We're interested in the uh, brain mechanisms of optimal state for performance. We're interested in how the brain changes state on a rapid basis and how that affects your ability to achieve a task, pay attention, uh, whatever that task is. It could be a scholastic task, or it could be a sports, or it could be uh, just about anything you need to pay attention to. So just as a general introduction, I want to say that, um, remind you all that the brain undergoes large, medium, and small state variations over time scales ranging from hours to milliseconds. I have a couple of pictures here of uh, my grandson when he was born a few years ago, uh, when he was sleepy and then when he's wide awake, even though he was only a, a couple of days old. <clears throat> we used to study the transitions that go from sleep to waking because that's the largest transition you'll have in your brain um, or normally. But now we're very interested in transitions that affect your performance during waking. For example, here's a high-performance athlete trying to hit the bullseye, and sometimes they can hit the bullseye repeatedly. Sometimes it's more difficult, and they uh, may vary on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. We're very interested in those rapid 
state changes and the possibility that you might be able to control them. Over a hundred years ago, Yerkes and Dotson published their main famous relationship between arousal or stress and performance, which is called the yerkes dotson curve. And what they found was that there's an optimal kind of Goldilocks region for performance, which is in the middle where you're either not too stressed or you're just stressed just the right amount. If your stress or arousal level is low, your performance is low. If your stress is very high or arousal is very high, your performance is high. But there's this kind of middle Goldilocks zone or you can perform the best. To examine the neural mechanisms of this, we need to work in an animal because of all the advantages you can do with an animal. We can put an electrode inside a mouse's brain, for example. We can image activity in the brain, or we can do manipulations of the brain activity. And we can ask, you know, how do these state changes, these rapid changes in arousal or stress, affect the ability of the animal to do a task. Now, the task needs to be somewhat difficult. So here's a task that we gave the animal where they have to target, they have to report whether there's a target tone embedded in a complex sound. This is an audiogram of what we're presenting to them through this speaker over here. The animal's hearing these complex sound, every once in a while there's a pure tone like a beep. And if the animal hears that beep, they can lick and get a reward, all right? So this beep is randomly presented to the animal and they're listening carefully. And if it's a very difficult, soft beep in the, embedded in the background, the animal may or may not get the task correct. And that's where we think attention and being the optimal zone is most effective. This work was done by Matt McGinley, who was a postdoc in my lab, and Lindsay's continued it on. Okay, here's a picture of a setup that uh, we just saw a drawing of. This is the wheel that the animal is sitting on. They can walk or run. That helps relax the animal. Their head is fixed so that we can do imaging or recording. This would hold a recording electrode. This would be an imaging microscope right here above the animal, the, above the head of the mouse, which is about the size of this white cup placed here, All right? They're in a sound booth chamber so that we close the door and they're isolated both visually and, and uh, hearing wise. Okay, so we uh, understand and know that the animal undergoes rapid state changes. Imagine, um, I call it seminar behavior or classroom behavior. Some of the students are attentive at any moment in time. Some of them are drifting off. Their attention's drifted to something else. Some of them are drowsy. And then it mixes up. Every few minutes, an attentive student becomes attentive. And the student that was paying attention is no longer paying attention. So this happens in normal people. It happens in mice on a second-to-second -second basis. So we need to be able to measure the state of the animal as far as their attention goes and their engagement. And we measured that in two ways. We measured the activity of their brain, specifically in the hippocampus, which has a lot to do with navigating space and memory in a mouse. But we also did it by just watching the pupil of the animal. Pupil diameter tells you uh, a bit about the attentional state of a person or an animal. We also monitored where the animal was walking or not. Here's a recording from the hippocampus of the brain, but I want to show you just to hear an example of what the animal was doing on a moment-to-moment -moment basis in their brain and in their body. So we looked at the pupil in red and up is dilation. And this is 20 seconds. So this is two or three seconds of dilation, a second or two of constriction, another dilation of constriction. So the state of the animal or state of a person is never perfectly the same. It's always either getting a little more aroused, or a little less aroused. This is even during uh, waking, all right? So this state is varying on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. Here's when the mouse ran, ran for a little bit, he walked, and the pupil dilates a lot. And the black is the brain state, which is the state of the hippocampus. And you can see that the brain state and the pupil state follow each other quite well. And this is true even when the animal is sitting still, he's not walking. You have these periods of, 
arousal and periods of inattentiveness and periods of attentiveness and inattentiveness, and they wax and wane over the periods of 10, 20, 30 seconds or so. You can ask, you know, how does that affect the animal's ability to do the task? Green is when he got the task right. He licked when he should have. He heard the tone inside the, the complex sound. Red is when he licked and he shouldn't have. He should have withheld his licking, but he licked instead. And blue is he didn't lick when he should have, all right? So this mouse is, is getting a lot of trials correct, but he's also making a lot of mistakes. Now let's compare that with pupil diameter, which tells us something about the state of the brain. And the pupil is dilating and constricting, dilating and constricting over a period of about three hours for this. If we compare the animal ability to do this task with the pupil diameter, what you see is we get exactly the Yerkes, Dotson curve. If the animal is, is low level of arousal, which means your pupil would be quite small, the performance is very low. If the if pupil is quite large, the animal is stressed or anxious, the performance also is quite low. But in the middle zone, where the pupil is about middle sized, the performance of the animal is best. DARPA had started a program a few years ago where they wondered if through stimulation of different peripheral nerves, vagal nerve being one of them, uh, you could control the brain state of an adult person. And you could then control whether they learn well or are they in the right zone for learning? Do they, can you enhance synaptic plasticity in the brain? Uh, could you enhance the uh, rate of acquisition of information in a person? So they started a program to ask this question and they wanted people to stimulate the vagal nerve or different parts of different uh, uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic nerve pathways to see if they could control brain state to enhance learning. And our idea was to take a mouse, not a human, but here's some different types of stimulation that's been applied to human, either in tongue, auricular, around the throat, mouth, and so on. If we could take a mouse and stimulate the vagal nerve and control the state of the brain of the animal and put them in that optimal zone. So we were wondering whether we could stimulate the nerve and either move them from a low arousal to a higher arousal, from a high arousal to a middle arousal to get the mouse into the optimal zone to learn better and to perform better. So with that in mind, that was my brief introduction, uh, Lindsay took up the task of asking what does vagal nerve stimulation do in the first place to the behavioral state of the mouse and to the brain. So Lindsay's gonna continue on from here with her study. Great, thank you. Um, do I now have control? There we go. All right, so um, we looked at this from the view of neuromodulation in terms of activating neuromodulatory pathways. So um, what we know is that the vagus nerve innervates the nucleus of the solitary tract in the brainstem, which then sends projections to several places, including the locus ceruleus, locus ceruleus being this bilateral nucleus that is home to um, a lot of uh, noradrenergic cell bodies that then send projections all throughout the brain, including places like the thalamus, the cortex, the basal forebrain. Um, so if you or to stain for tyrosine hydroxylase. So we're looking at just noradrenergic cells here in the locus ceruleus. See, there's this really widespread distribution of fibers. So we thought that maybe this was one way that stimulating the vagus nerve could cause this really broad change in brain activity and result in changes in arousal state or behavioral state. Um, here's, a, here's another lovely diagram showing that it's going to places like the thalamus, olfactory centers, frontal centers, motor sensory, and even other brainstem centers. And we know based on work um, come out of Dr. McCormick's lab and come out of others that the locus ceruleus is involved with wakefulness and increased arousal state. So this we've actually um, have known for quite some time. This is an, the top um, figure you're looking at is out of Carl Dyserath's lab and they're optogenetically stimulating the locus ceruleus. 
and showing that um, optogenetic stimulation will trigger a transition from a REM sleep state to an awake state. Um, in more recent work out of Mrigonka Sur's lab, showed that optogenetic stimulation of the locus ceruleus will trigger in pupil dilation. And if you um, optogenetically inhibit the locus ceruleus, you can actually uh, cause a pupil constriction. So we have some pretty good evidence that activating the locus ceruleus would um, change arousal or uh, your wakefulness state. So as I mentioned, the um, locus ceruleus sends projections all throughout the brain. One of these regions is the basal forebrain, which is another um, neuromodulatory center that we're gonna look at. So the basal forebrain contains a large population of cholinergic neurons. So here on the left, you're looking at this um, lovely work, looking at all of the uh, choline uh, acetyl transferase staining throughout the brain. So you can see this really large region of um, cell stained at the bottom of the brain here. That's where we're gonna be looking. And if you inject into that region an anterograde tracer, that there's projections all throughout the brain um, stemming from the basal forebrain. So again, we have this pathway by which simulation of the vagus nerve might um, increase or change activity in broad cortical and subcortical regions. And similar to the locus ceruleus, we know that stimulation of the basal forebrain is also associated with changes in wakefulness and an increase in arousal state. So if you stimulate the basal forebrain in a mouse, you will, um, the mouse will spend more time in a wakeful state as opposed to a non-REM state. And even within the waking state, uh, work from uh, Dr. McCormick's lab has shown that activity of cholinergic cells tracks behavioral state very, very well. So here you're looking in green is um, walking speed. In gray is pupil dilation. So just like we was just talking about, as the animal walks, you see an increase in pupil diameter. And this is also tracked in orange by activity of um, acetylcholine expressing cells or axons within the cortex. And this is it actually tracks really well to small changes, very like brief timescale changes um, that can be tracked by movements of the mouse's face. So here we're looking at whisking activity in green, cholinergic axon activity in black, so that they track super well. Um, and even when the animal isn't engaging in these large motor activity changes, um, so here the green is straight, meaning that the animal is still the whole time, you still see a change in cholinergic axon activity as the um, pupil dilates and constricts. So we knew a little bit, or we had some indication that stimulating the vagus nerve might um, change behavioral or arousal state via these mechanisms. So this is work out of a lab at University of Texas in Dallas by Daniel Hulsey, who is actually now um, a postdoc in David's lab. Um, and he did this great study where he recorded from uh, cells within the locus ceruleus and measured what their activity was after vagus nerve stimulation to see if the vagus nerve stimulation actually is activating the locus ceruleus. And he found that it indeed is. The yellow is vagus nerve stimulation on. Um, and this is just a raster plot of spikes within the locus ceruleus. And you see a dose dependent change such that if you increase current intensity, you increase the number of spikes that you see in the locus ceruleus in response to vagus nerve stimulation. And this is a summary plot at the bottom, same data. And we also have some indication that this is working, this, that the uh, change in behavioral state that could occur it might be working through metabotropic muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. Um, so we know that vagus nerve stimulation um, does excite cortical neurons. So after vagus nerve stimulation, spontaneous spiking in the cortex increases, and this effect can be nullified if you give a muscarinic receptor blocker. So we set out to see if um, through these pathways, we might be able to see a change in behavioral or arousal state that might change um, performance of an animal um, like David introduced very well already. So to do this work, we hand make these tiny electrodes, they're little silicon tubes 
where we um, thread wire and then lay the vagus nerve right on top. That's the dotted line here. So we're able to deliver stimulation directly to the nerve itself and not surrounding tissue. And our lead wires come out to the top of the mouse's head where they're connected to these gold pins that we connect to a stimulus isolator so we can very precisely control the timing and the intensity of the stimulation in an awake um, behaving animal. So we implant these surgically um, and the mice recover pretty well. We sew them up, they recover, and then we're able to do our experiments. Here's just a diagram of the experimental setup that you were shown earlier. So you have a wheel, just to remind you, a wheel where we can measure rotational velocity to see how quickly the animal is moving. We can also see little forward and backward movements. It's pretty sensitive. We also um, measure some sort of brain activity. So this is either wide field imaging or electrophysiology or two photon imaging. I'll show you um, some data from those three techniques today. And during all of this, we're recording um, activity from the mouse's face. So here's an example recording. And what I think is really nice to note here is that these small movements in the face actually are translated um, into dilations and constrictions of the pupils. So you can see as the animal starts whisking a little more, the pupil will dilate and it will constrict as um, it gets more quiet and less aroused. All right. So as our first pass, we're gonna look at pupil dilation. So we're just gonna measure what it, how is this pupil responding when we deliver vagus nerve stimulation. And when we do this, we see that there's a pretty consistent increase in pupil diameter following vagus nerve stimulation. So for all of these graphs, you're looking at a comparison between the two seconds before vagus nerve stimulation, what is the pupil diameter right before, to two seconds after vagus nerve stimulation. And pretty consistently, we see an increase um, in this dilation. Um, and there's only you know, a couple trials where we didn't see this. It's pretty, pretty consistent and robust. We noticed that there was an interesting state dependent component to this effect. So if the animal was in a low arousal state before we deliver vagus nerve stimulation, so that would be shown here, you know, lower um, pre-VNS pupil size, then we saw a, a higher increase in the percent change after VNS. We also noted that this was dose dependent. So increasing, there we go, increasing either the intensity of the stimulation, so we just deliver between 100 microamps to one milliamp of current at different durations. We're showing here five seconds, one second VNS, and then half a second VNS. You see a dose-dependent change in the amount of pupil dilation um, observed in the animal. All right. So sometimes when we deliver VNS, the, the animal will initiate uh, behaviors such as walking or whisking, other times they won't. So we're gonna separate these out because as um, mentioned before, the pupil tracks the behavioral state of the animal really well. So we wanna make sure that what we're measuring isn't just, like when we look at pupil dilation, isn't just because the animal started walking. Like that. So on the far left here, you're looking at pupil dilation in response to a VNS stimulation in gray that did elicit both walking and whisking. This is averaged over several trials that um, elicited a walk. You see a pretty robust increase in pupil. Same thing occurs if the animal only whisks. And um, notably, it still happens when the mouse is still. So when there's no VNS triggered um, motion or behavioral change, you still see a arousal state increase as measured by pupil dilation. Um, and one last check, just to make sure that we're not, this is effect isn't um, from muscle tension or something that we're not able to observe. We lightly anesthetize the animal and still see this pupil increase even um, in the absence of any detectable motion. We then um, transected the vagus nerve, both um, above and below where we put the cuff. So we're getting rid of all afferent and efferent efferation applied stimulation and found that all pupil dilation and behavioral changes went away. So we know that we're not um, stimulating the surrounding musculature that might cause like some sort of muscle tension or something like that, or the mouse isn't feeling it. All right, so now I wanna look at what this actually does to the brain. So first I'm gonna show you our evidence that uh, vagus nerve stimulation activates um, cortical excitation. 
So what you're looking at here is a wide field video. I hope it's coming through well. Um, we're, I'm showing you the whole dorsal surface of a mouse brain. We can see motor, somatosensory, visual, and retrosplenial cortices bilaterally. So this is translated here in this video. Top is anterior, bottom is posterior. So you know, you're seeing motor about in here, somatosensory about in here, visual about in here. When you see this white box, that represents vagus nerve stimulation on. This is an image that's collected across all trials that we perform, so many, many trials over six mice um, combined together. And this is what you see, so you see these really you know, complex cortical dynamics going on, and then the stimulus comes on and the whole cortex lights up. So this is calcium activity. We're looking at excitation of um, excitatory cells. And while I'm here, I want to quickly note I'll show you again, there is a, a region right around in here that will light up really consistently and very brightly um, right in there. So this is where we're gonna focus a lot of the um, data analysis from here on out. So I wanna make sure to show that to you. But we wanted to make sure that it wasn't just this, like, just the part of the brain that was getting activated. So we developed a new um, way of imaging the lateral side of the cortex. So here you can see auditory cortex as well as barrel cortex. Again, anterior front, posterior back. Right here, you'll see the uh, midline. So you can see some of the left hemisphere, but mostly right. And you'll see a really, really strong activation of all cortical regions that we image. There's those cool cortical dynamics. And there's the stimulus, really bright um, excitation. So of course we quantified this. Um, we looked at, so we basically pulled all pixels, looked at how activated is the cortex um, when we deliver varying intensities of vagus nerve stimulation. So we looked at three different current intensities, one to uh, 100 to 800 microamps. We varied the pulse width from 100 to 800 microseconds. And we also um, varied the duration of the stimulation itself from five seconds to one to half a second, like I showed you before. And we saw a dose-dependent increase in um, cortical activation, similar to how we saw a dose-dependent activation of uh, pupil dilation. And we also noted that it is that this response was state-dependent in that if the VNS evoked uh, behavioral activation, we see a greater um, a more widespread and a stronger activation of the cortex. So when the VNS uh, triggered a walking or whisking bout or walking with whisking, every time the animal walks, there's a little bit of whisking activity. Um, and combined over all our trials, we see this really robust increase across the brain. When the VNS only triggered whisking, you see a widespread but a little bit muted response. And then of course we lightly anesthetize the animal to make sure that we're not just imaging and motion um, response, and we still see uh, activation of many cortical regions above the level of significance. And if we quantify this um, change in GCAMP activity or calcium signaling in excitatory cells, we see that there's a robust increase in all brain regions that we looked at. We're, here you're seeing motor, somatosensory, retrosplenial, and visual cortices in both the left and the right hemisphere as well as the auditory and barrel cortex of the right hemisphere. And in all three states that we looked at, walking, whisking, and lightly anesthetized, you see a dramatic increase in uh, DF over F, which is our measure of cortical excitability um, at the onset of vagus nerve stimulation, which is of course muted when we um, perform this in lightly anesthetized animals. And this uh, is a, just showing you the time course of this response. So on the x-axis here, we're just increasing in time from the beginning of VNS onset to the end. We're giving a one second VNS um, application here. So here you're taking a little snapshot. What does the brain look like at 200, 400, 600, so on milliseconds after um, VNS onset? And we see uh, that pretty rapidly within 400 milliseconds, we're seeing a response in the cortex um, to the vagus nerve stimulation. All right, 
So we then wanted to know whether this effect could be explained by activity within layer two, three um, cell bodies. So one disadvantage to wide field imaging is that um, you, you get activity of not only cell bodies, but you're also seeing neuropill and the spatial resolution isn't quite as good as something like a two photon could give you. So we are lucky enough to have this very um, fantastic microscope that is a two, two photon mesoscope that allows for imaging within a five by five millimeter um, region of interest simultaneously, of course, with some um, temporal and spatial uh, you know, trade-offs. So here you're looking at three regions recorded simultaneously. This is in the motor cortex, this is somatosensory cortex, and this is visual cortex. Um, and you see these little dots are all of our excitatory cell bodies um, being measured at the same time. So this is just taken from a single experiment just to show you what it might look like. We then take these data, feed it through um, a cell identification program that will pull out what um, pixels are cor correspond with specific cell bodies. So we're getting rid of all of those like dendrites and axons that we um, that might be coming in from different places. And so this is this is the data that we're working with here. And we see that there's again a very quick and consistent increase in activity within these cell bodies um, at the onset of vagus nerve stimulation. It actually goes up about at the same time course as the behavioral activations of the whisker pad changes really, really quickly in response to vagus nerve stimulation. And that's when you see this increase in cortical activity as well. So again, to quantify this effect, when we gave a one second uh, simulation of the vagus nerve, we see this really dramatic increase in cortical activity of these cells. And if we lightly anesthetize the animal, we still get a really robust increase. When the animal was anesthetized, the response was a bit smaller and it was a bit um, more delayed. So time to half max was a little bit longer than during the awake um, state. And during the awake state, the response is a little more sustained, likely because there's um, ongoing motor activities of the animal might be walking or whisking in response to the stimulation. All right, so getting even closer, looking even more detailed um, into the uh, cortical activation, we did multi-unit recordings within this hotspot region. So it's this region that's kind of right in between the somatosensory, motor, visual cortex, kind of where they all converge. Um, close to uh, where posterior parietal cortex might be, maybe like an association region. We're not really sure why this region particularly is the region that is most activated, but it was very consistently activated, so we stuck an electrode in to see what happens. Here's an um, example recording. In green, you're looking at multi-unit activity, so this is activity from um, many cells recorded within um, that region, and, it, and it's alongside whisker pad, walk, speed and pupil dilation, just like you're probably very used to seeing now. And so when we do this, we notice that there's a increased in a increased firing within these cells um, very quickly at the onset of VNS. And when the animal walks, this increase is sustained throughout that walking bout. And if we pull out only um, instances where VNS did not trigger walking, where it triggered a pupil dilation, but no whisking or locomotor activity, you still see a transient increase in firing rate within this region, but it quickly diminishes and you don't see that sustained component. Okay, so to get back to where um, we kind of started this whole thing, um, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, the vagus nerve innervates the locus ruleus, which innervates the basal forebrain and sends projections everywhere. So we ultimately wanted to know if these behavioral effects that I showed, so this pupil dilation walking effect and this cortical activation could be partially explained by activation of these um, neuromodulatory circuits. So what I'm gonna do is show you recordings that we did um, of axons that are here in the cortex that are from cell bodies that are located in these neuromodulatory centers. So what I do, I, I inject a um, anterograde um, virus into the locus ruleus, which then um, uh, allows for these axons to be um, calcium dependently fluorescing. So when there's more calcium in the cell, we'll get a response. So 
you should be able to see what that looks like here. So here's an example recording on the left, you're looking at a cholinergic recording. On the right, you're looking at noradrenergic. Um, little lines are axons. You can see three really strong axons here or really bright axons, several cholinergic axons shown in this figure. At the bottom, you're looking at just an example recording. And what I think it's really nice to note is that the cholinergic activity here in blue and the noradrenergic activity in red track the behavioral state of the animal remarkably well. And that when VNS is applied, you see peaks in both noradrenergic and cholinergic activity. There we go. All right, so we then of course will quantify this. Um, so we looked at the time course of activation of the noradrenergic and cholinergic fibers aligned to the onset of whisker pad motion. And we found that for noradrenaline, it tracks the onset of that whisker pad motion really, really well. And even when the animal doesn't whisk at all, we still see an increase in noradrenergic activity. In the cholinergic axons, we saw a very similar response when uh, the vagus nerve stimulation did induce whisker activity whisker pad motion, um, but when there was no whisker pad motion, the response of the cholinergic fibers was uh, much diminished. So this is shown again here, uh, when the, the darkest traces so this dark red and dark blue are trials where walking and whisking was elicited. You see this really robust increase in both noradrenergic and cholinergic activity. When the animal only performed a small whisk in response to the um, vagus nerve stimulation, you see a still huge response of noradrenergic fibers, but a much uh, weaker response from the cholinergic fibers, although it is still significantly different than baseline. And when we lightly anesthetize the animal, we still see a, an increase in both noradrenaline and acetylcholine, but like in the small whisk, um, uh, during the, the small whisk trials, the um, cholinergic activity isn't quite as strong as when uh, walking is elicited. So there's something special about this um, activated behavioral component that um, triggers cholinergic activity as well. The gray bar, by the way, is um, autofluorescent blebs. It's a um, control to make sure that this isn't a motion artifact. So we're pretty sure that there's no motion artifact going into that response. All right. So I will wrap up here by showing you um, basically a summary diagram of all of the data that I've shown you today. Here you're looking at awake state on the left, anesthetized on the right. Darker values represent um, stronger activation. And so what we found was one that vagus nerve stimulation activates these neuromodulatory systems. So it activates um, not only the locus ceruleus noradrenaline system, but also the basal forebrain acetylcholine system in both the awake state and the anesthetized state. We also showed that vagus nerve stimulation leads to cortical excitation um, using both two photon imaging, so we're looking at those cell bodies individually, as well as wide field imaging, so we're looking across the cortex. Um, and that, again, is in both the awake and anesthetized state. You see this increase. And then finally, um, this results in an overall change in arousal state or behavioral state. So we measured this with looking at whisker pad movement, walking and pupil dilation. Of course, the animal doesn't whisk or walk in the anesthetized state, but you still see an increase in pupil dilation. So this is all really exciting um, work um, to give you a little bit of an introduction to what we're doing next. We've just started this next project, so we don't have a lot of data yet, but just to give you a little something to get excited for. We've started working with um, a colleague at the University of Oregon, Tim Gardner, and he has established, or he's, um, yeah, established this protocol for recording from peripheral nerves in a wake up behaving animals, which is really exciting. Um, so he has this uh, 3D printed nano clips. So you have this electrode array here at the bottom. The nerve then just gets squished inside this little clip and it gets held very securely right against this um, electrode pad. So you're able to um, 
record um, really high fidelity um, active potentials from the peripheral nerve itself in animals that are awake, moving, um, head fixed, or freely moving. Um, so, so far we're getting some pretty good results. We don't have any um, concrete data to share with you today, but this is kind of where we're headed next to see if um, we can measure the actual activity of the vagus nerve in response to stimulation of the vagus nerve to kind of get a better idea of how, um, how well we're actually stimulating the nerve. And then also in um, instances where the, you know, the vagus nerve stimulation isn't used, how is the vagus nerve responding to or controlling changes in uh, heart rate, pupil dilation, behavioral changes, things like that. Um, so it looks like I am yep, just on time. So with that, I will go back to our conclusion slide so that you can kind of have an idea of where we, where we ended and take any questions. Thank you, Lindsay, for for really fantastic uh, uh, presentation. Really, really nice. So let me see. While waiting for questions, let me ask you some of mine. I have so many of them. So yeah, uh, your last slide uh, with your new uh, direction was really exciting. I mean, like everything else. Uh, just one, one question came to my mind uh, related to the slide. Where do you record peripherally? Like you recording, you stimulating, you have the same setup for, sur for venous surgery and stimulation side as I, as I understand. But where are you recording now? If it's on periphery. Um, you mean like where on the nerve? Yeah, yeah. You're saying you 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 are right now. The new direction that the red out will be uh, not in the in the brain, but it's going to be in periphery. So where? Yeah. So these yeah these would record these recordings would be on the vagus nerve itself. Um, so it's you know below nodus ganglion. So it's this, it's not a, a branch. You know, it'd be really lovely if we could get a very specific branch that's going to the lungs or the ear or something. But we we haven't gotten it quite. The you know the surgical method quite good enough for that yet. Um, so yeah, right now we're we're kind of getting um, recordings from just that that big bulk of all the fibers coming up through right before it gets to the notochordium. So you're basically going to be uh, you're gonna you're you are recording at the same location as you uh, uh, stimulating. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep, that's correct. Yeah, and these are these are incredibly small. You can actually get more than one, you can get several of these clips onto the nerve at one time. The problem then becomes, you know, getting that many head stages on a mouse's head. So you know, we can't we can't record from too many locations. But um, the idea would be uh, one idea that we would love to pursue is stimulating and recording within the same mouse, um, so that we can because you know you, you never know how much of that stimulation is truly getting to the vagus nerve, even though you're really precisely controlling it. Um, you know what the nerve is actually doing is another is a whole other question. So this would be one way to kind of verify that um, our vagus nerve stimulation is uh, very, you know, reliable and that it's actually activating the nerve in the way that we expect it to. Yeah, it's controlling controlling experiment by itself. And the uh, uh, technical question came to my mind. Uh, it's probably too, too technical, uh, but <laughs> it's interesting. Do you have artifacts? I mean, if it's so close, uh, how are you dealing with artifacts if you're stimulating and recording almost in the same area? Yeah, so we haven't actually, so this is something that is technically, you know, theoretically possible, but we haven't actually tried. Um, so I'm sure that we will deal with this. I mean, you know, we might be able to blank somehow, but then, you know, in interpreting what that means after blanking might be difficult. Um, so yeah, definitely something that we're going to have to work out, um, which we're in the process. So hopefully that'll happen in the next year or so. We'll see. Lindsay, yeah. uh, in the human, right. vagus nerve is quite quite large, you know, mm. like a finger yeah. or something. But how big is it in a mouse? Just give people so, a perspective. Yeah, it's it's quite small. So the we we did some tests to see what size of this clip would work best. That's not going to squish the nerve, but it's going to allow for it not to just slide up and down. And what we're at is this diameter here being um, 150 microns. So that's that's the size we're talking about. Quite small. But do you think about doing this on rats? I know uh, we need mice for all GCAMP uh, targeting and everything, 
but we do have uh, calcium imaging targeted uh, reds as well. So did you think about mo uh, moving to reds or doing something? It will be easier yeah. in than Yeah, you know, we, we could. Um, we, we haven't actually talked about it. The, the mouse is honestly, you know, it, with with this nanoclip has not, hasn't been that difficult so far, um, just at least surgically. Um, so I don't think it's, you know, as of now, not quite worth it. Um, they've done a really nice job. So this was actually uh, developed to work in zebra finch. Um, so the size of the animal hasn't become too big of a problem right now. Right now we're working on um, motion artifacts, things like that. You know, things that rats are going to have a problem with too. No. I should move. I need to. I need to ask a question from the audience. I just. <laughs> have no. so, many. <laughs> okay. so we do have a question um, from uh, Brent Power. Do you believe that uh, auricular uh, vagus nerve stimulation impact on neurotransmitter brain structure is the same as a direct uh, uh, vinous impact in humans? It's a good question. I mean, so nothing that we've done can directly speak to this. Um, I don't know of any evidence that would suggest that it would work in a different mechanism. So I guess what, you know, so if the, if the, the pathway that we're suggesting here is that the vagus nerve innervates the locus ruleus, which then causes all of this effect. Um, so the, the question would really be, does the auricular branch innervate those same, that same part of, you know, like, would it robustly activate the locus ruleus in the same way that activation of the entire nerve where we're activating is? And I'm not sure what the answer to that is, um, but yeah, I mean, I think it would be, I mean, it's of course really interesting because of course it's much more applicable to humans. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure of anyone who's done that work. And in terms of uh, uh, human, uh, we're moving more into in, into non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I don't know, I'm not aware of any uh, rodent model of non-invasive non vagus nerve stimulation. Do, the, any, do any exist? It would be interesting to do something. Yeah. On so, so I know that people do, um, um, I'm struggling to remember which groups. Well, they will do um, non-invasive. I know there's at least one group um, that does non-invasive in the rat, um, just by like, uh, just, I don't know how they attach, but they'll attach a, a little electrical stimulation onto the outside that um, works with a magnet, I believe, actually, just like a human. Um, and, you know, you know, I'm assuming that it's, it, I haven't looked into that super deeply, but it probably, as long as you can make it specific to the vagus nerve, we'll have a very similar effect. So what we're doing is pretty, you know, rough, it's kind of crude. It's not very specific to the fibers that were, um, you know, which fibers in the vagus nerve we're actually stimulating. So if you're able to stimulate that entire nerve bundle non-invasively, then, you know, it, you, would, you would anticipate that you would see a very similar effect to what we were seeing. But as long believe, as you know, you're not stimulating yeah. the muscle or something like that. I absolutely agree with you, but with non-invasive, we will have even less specific uh, response. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, and I'm, so, I'm not sure how much. So it, it it is it is quite it is you know we're really not um, specific at all with what we're doing though. So I you know it's hard to get less specific aside from if you're just stimulating tissue that isn't nerve tissue. But you you still doing doing a beautiful job. So I have another question from Dr. Peter Stas. Sounds like you measure fixed time with variable amplitude. Did you vary time of stimulation to include minutes? No, no, we did not. So the the longest that we did, you know, we did some that I think we didn't report in the paper of like ten seconds, twenty seconds, but we didn't do anything longer than that. Um, we most of the data that we report are from one second stimulations, um, but we report some data from up to five. Um, but no, we haven't looked at a uh, long, long term at all. It's uh, it's not technically feasible or you just didn't go so far? Well, well we didn't, it and you know, we saw, so we saw that when we did uh, stimulate for these longer periods. So the one, the one thing that I'll point to is this multi-unit recording where we've simulated for five seconds and we saw that in the absence of behavioral changes, the cortical activation at least is pretty transient. So what we were more interested in is, you know, characterizing what is this, you know, what is the response, 
effect of this transient um, increase. So I, I don't know, but based on you know this this single piece of evidence, I would imagine that if we lengthen this gray bar out to several minutes, um, it's I don't know if you're going to I don't know if it would you know does that activity actually come back up and down? Does it oscillate on a very very slow time scale? That's the only way that I could imagine that you would see something different than this, um, in the absence of actual behavioral changes. And uh, you, you can you can keep the slide. I have a question for the slide. Uh, okay. So very interesting in terms of uh, multi-unit neuronal uh, response. So what well, you just said that, and uh, I will repeat you. So if we don't have uh, any moments, yeah, if it's stationary, uh, uh, vagus nerve stimulation is going to induce this uh, multi-unit activity, but everything will drop. Yeah, it will not stay if there are no any kind of motor activity. So, what can be the explanation for these uh, findings? Yeah. So the the way that we kind of think of it is that the vagus nerve stimulation, like when when it's first applied, will um, you know activate this pathway that then increases cortical excitation, and then once that happens, there's sort of a gate that's open that'll that, you know that triggers the animal to do some sort of movement, which then causes some sort of um, increase in cortical activity, just like you would see in, an, you know, just a, a regular spontaneous behavior, you know, not um, triggered by the vagus nerve at all. So you're kind of seeing, you know, in here, maybe not even mediated by that vagus nerve simulation, that this might be something that you would just expect to see in a walking animal. Yeah, this is what I'm trying to actually uh, ask you. Yeah, mm. it's actually reflecting, reflecting uh, motor activity, not the effect of the vagus nerve stimulation. Am I understanding? Yeah, that would, be, that would be the hypothesis, yeah. And if we correlate this with uh, uh, calcium imaging activity, uh, is it going to be the same? So if we don't have, uh, yeah, you do have that kind of data, but you, you remember your data. So <laughs> if we, uh, so if, if, yeah. if, if there is no activity, is is a is a, a calcium imaging uh, a, a calcium activity oh. will. I'm going the wrong way, but yes. So the one graph that I think demonstrates this best is here. So in the awake state where we are including, so the awake state we're actually including stimulations where the animal did move and didn't move, just all of them. But then the anesthetized state, of course, this is only stimulations that didn't elicit any motor activity then that um, sustained component is kind of pulled away. So, and this is with uh, calcium activity. So they are actually correlating. I mean, they, they go in the same direction. It will drop. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so our multi-unit and our two-photon data um, look just alike in that regard, yeah. Yeah, unless uh, they are reflecting up with all different mechanisms, uh, they should go in parallel. Yeah, they, yeah they're, it would be very surprising if they didn't. <laughs> in a different way, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Coming back to one of your few slides in terms of uh, protocols, I know people want to know about specificity. Everybody have this in mind right now on the call. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you did a great job of applying a, a lot of uh, different kind of parameters. Yeah, so yeah, well, we, we kind of did a, a, you know, a sweep to see scroll. what would activate the best. Yeah, you can, you can scroll to the beginning. So one okay. of your uh, first uh, picture, oh, which corresponds to the first picture in the paper. Uh, yeah, you, you you did an exhaustive uh, application of different kind of parameters, and it looks like it uh, is it a linear uh, like a uh, dependence. So with the increase of different kind of amplitude, frequency, and and pulse wave uh, arousal will go yeah. up. So it does it does positively correlate. We did not look at whether um, you know a linear increase in um, current intensity would translate to a linear increase in pupil diameter, diameter and then also whole brain responses. We didn't test to see if there, were like, if there was that um, uh, type of relationship, but it is, it is positively correlated such that you know, more, um, like a longer uh, simulation itself, so if the duration is longer, the intensity is higher, or if the pulse width is longer, which would, of course, translate to more stimulation, um, there is a greater response, not only behaviorally, but also in that cortical activation. 
So from uh, all that kind of series of experiments, uh, could you identify any kind of, you know, set of parameters which uh, would more specifically, for example, if we go to that area which you concentrated uh, for the second part of your uh, project, yeah, uh, which was uh, flashing so so brightly. So it, does that correlate with the particular, uh, you know, Vinayas protocol? Yeah. So I will I will say two things. So first, um, we kind of we kind of, the way we structured this um, series of experiments was a little in reverse. So we did our parameter sweep to see what's going to reliably activate the pupil, what's going to reliably reliably give us this arousal activation, and then looked into what does that how does that translate to the brain. Um, so in that in that regard, I don't have a great answer for you. Um, but I will say that one of our collaborators did this a little more exhaustively. Um, so actually. Uh, David mentioned him at the beginning, Matt McGinley, who's at Baylor, has a paper out as of last year. It was a, just a, around the same time as this um, that looks at cholinergic activity um, in a wider variety of parameters. So if you haven't checked that paper out, I would highly recommend it. Okay, so I we have a few minutes and I still have a uh, few questions for you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And I know uh, clinical people on the call would would ask. Uh, I totally understand why you chose that kind of behavioral uh, readouts. So, mm. but how about uh, autonomic uh, stimulation? So, pupil dilation is is one of the uh, part of the autonomic uh, stim stimulation and the reflection of the arousal. But how about uh, heart rate and respiratory rate? I mean, yeah. So yeah. yeah, well, we chose we chose pupil dilation, whisker pad energy or motion, whisker pad movement and walking because um, so based on other data that we've collected in the lab, they explain a lot of variability in cortical activity, in excitatory cells, some inhibitory cells and in these two neuromodulatory um, cell types. So based on that, we thought that that would be a nice, um, well, if, you know, if it, if it explains a lot of activity in those cells, that's a good place to start. But uh, for example, for I yeah, I completely understand. There is so much foundation for parameters you use, and so much uh, so so many the uh, studies done already for for you know for the, confirming that pupil dilation is actually a reflection of arousal on on mice in your setup. But uh, for vagus nerve stimulation, yeah, heart rate and respiratory rate. Uh, monitoring them would be somehow, you know, more, like not more, so it would, would be another uh, good uh, uh, readout, which is the physiologically, because this is the yeah. part of the uh, vagus uh, function. Yeah, and yeah, like, that's, that's something that, yeah, I know a lot of labs will do not only heart rate, but also blood oxygenation level, just as a readout of, um, not necessarily arousal state changes, but as a readout of, how how good how reliable is your vagus nerve stimulation itself? You know, is is your cuff on well? Is it working reliably? Um, and so yeah, we we are more collaborators of ours actually um, are are doing exactly that by looking at um, blood oxygenation level and heart rate um, and see something different. But that yeah, but it's not really to look at arousal state changes. It's to look at you know what is the vagus nerve is the vagus nerve truly being stimulated. Which is a little mm -hmm. bit of a different angle than what we were going for. Yeah, yeah it could be like a validation, additional validation that uh, you do have a, a vagus nerve stimulation. Yeah. There. Yeah. Okay. I have tons of questions, but yeah, we are out of time. Well, uh, you're welcome yeah. to email. Happy to answer via email always. Thank you. And uh, to uh, conclude our uh, great webinar today, uh, how do you see? clinical application and I will give you like uh, my thinking on that how about uh, I know there are clinical trials going on for post-traumatic stress disorder so I mean what do you see uh, uh, it's like it's 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 so you know I see application of research uh, uh, you're doing in uh, you know in trying to explain how vagus nerve stimulation can affect and help uh, uh, patients uh, with uh, PTSD. But uh, uh, what do you think? Well, I mean, I think that this is a good question we should pitch to David as well. But I, I see it very a lot um, as 
when we use vagus nerve stimulation, we should be aware that it's activating these pathways that not only control arousal state, but might also be important for things like uh, neuroplasticity. So, um, you know, cool, cholinergic activation is, is known to help facilitate um, plasticity in cortical regions. And so, you know, maybe that's a mechanism for why, um, you know, reshaping responses in P PTSD might be um, effective. So I think that this is, you know, just kind of adding a little more evidence towards that being the mechanism underlying that type of effect. Um, if they would say yeah. more. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the great discussion. So I would like to conclude our last uh, journal club of the year. Thank you for everyone who joined us today and happy holidays. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Bye.